was, I was here for the tail end of the OpenMP uh, session yesterday. So I hope you've got some energy today because uh, that, that was a marathon. <laughs> and in some sense, it reflects the complexity of modern OpenMP, which is it can do pretty much anything you ask it to do. I'm going to talk about something rather more focused and streamlined, something more, very much targeted to uh, graphics processing units. Um, so I'm going to give you a background on myself, uh, just so you can get a sense of where I'm coming from. I'm a little bit different from some of the previous speakers and some of the speakers you'll see. I'm, a, I'm an applied mathematician by training. Actually, my PhD advisor was an engineer. Uh, I was a math student, undergraduate, applied math graduate student, working for an engineer. So over time, I've become more and more applied and more and more computational. And I'm going to give you the perspective of a computational scientist, not somebody from a, a vendor, not a representative from a vendor. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I've got no vested interest in any product. I'm not going to tell you that for commercial reasons, OpenMP is better than OpenACC. I'm not going to tell you that NVIDIA's or CUDA is better than anything else. I'm just going to give you some relative merits, ups and downs of using these different programming models. Um, I'm going to try and explode some myths about GPUs. You may have heard some propaganda, and I'm just trying to cut through some of the propaganda you might have heard, that uh, instantly your code's going to be 100 times faster. The OpenACC pixies are going to come visit your code. <laughs> You're going to run the code, and this, magically it's going to be 100 times faster. It's just, frankly, not going to happen. Um, I'll drill back down into some of the history and give you a bit of a historical uh, perspective on how GPUs have evolved over the last few years and th briefly talk about where they're going and why they're important. Frankly, your laptops, your desktops, your servers, your large uh, clusters, your supercomputers, they are very, very competent central processing units. They can, their, their performance on node performance is now reaching teraflop without the GPU. Why do we care about this? So, with the CPU, why do we care about the GPU? What is it that keeps us looking at these sort of esoteric devices? Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to NVIDIA's uh, single vendor solution for programming the GPU, the CUDA, because it's the simplest way to get started on GPUs and actually get your hands dirty. And so you can get, get to understand a little bit more about the architecture and how you have to interact with the architecture to get best performance. So we'll talk about sort of best practices for GPU programming. Um, I've got some hands-on. Hopefully, they'll work. Uh, GPU programming is a little bit tricky. Not, not hugely tricky, but it's detail-oriented. So um, the hands-on, I'm afraid, are quite prescriptive because if I just say, go and code this in CUDA, that probably won't go get very far. So I've sort of given, I have some examples where I just lead you through some uh, GPU programming. I've included slides on, uh, brief slides on CUDA optimization, optimizing code specifically for GPUs. Um, but I'm not going to touch those. I've just kept them in for completeness. Partly because I've, as we see each generation of, of, of NVIDIA GPU and AMD GPU, the specifics of how you actually program them become less and less important. They are, as the, as the hardware matures, as the compilers mature, it becomes more straightforward to get best performance. However, if you're really serious, you, you need to go and look at the details of the architecture and really map your algorithms very carefully to the architecture, in particular, looking at the memory hierarchy and exploiting every resource that's available. And then I'm going to take a little bit of a detour and talk about portability. So if you choose to program in CUDA, uh, you are beholden to NVIDIA's future. If NVIDIA <coughs> gets bought, gets, goes out of business, suddenly your programming solution no longer is uh, available. And roughly, rule, rule of thumb is if you've got a competent, CP, uh, competent code, computational science code, some modeling code, simulation code, for instance, an academic code maybe costs single-digit millions, so one, two, three million dollars to write. If you add up all the, all the time, effort that's put into these codes, it costs millions to write. If you look at uh, a larger DOE platform, 
we're talking at least $10 million, $20 million to write one of these codes. So you're putting a fairly hefty bet on NVIDIA's future as a viable company, as an independent company that can provide the CUDA solution. So I'll talk about some ways you can uh, hedge your bets and uh, aim and write code that can target multiple platforms, uh, GPU, CPU, so that you aren't quite as vulnerable to um, changes in the marketplace and changes in NVIDIA's mission. And I have a fairly lightweight but fun example. Maybe it, Are we all familiar with the, uh, um, his honorable flying spaghetti, his honor the flying spaghetti monster? Yes? So um, what we'll do is we've written a, a very simple Lattice Boltzmann flow code that's going to uh, generate flow simulations. We'll, what, we, what we'll need you to do is find a PNG format image file with a white background, whatever you like, make it family friendly, and we'll feed that into a portable flow solver and you'll be able to generate movies like this. So during the break, what we'd like you to do is get hold of some, um, some PNG file, it has to be PNG, and we can, you'll be able to generate movies like this, and we'll be able to switch between different compute modes. We'll be able to compute using CUDA, OpenCL, or OpenMP, your choice, whatever's available on the system. Right. Okay, so, and of course, it goes without saying that if you have any questions, please ask, just shout out, raise your hand, whatever you need to do to get our attention. So I promised I'd tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my research. Uh, I'm a mathematician, as I mentioned, so I spend an inordinate amount of my time worrying about uh, functional analysis, uh, approximation theory, um, finite element discretizations. So I spend a good amount of time here thinking about the numerical methods, and, um, and then I'm thinking, well, about the theory to prove something about them. But I also don't stop there. I go to uh, numerical methods, discretizations, and physical models, and we implement them. Now, because of the power available in these accelerators, in GPUs, um, everything we do is, has, to be, has to target this kind of architecture. We'll talk about that why later. And then we are very concerned with uh, scalability. My team is part of an Exascale co-design center, which is uh, joint between uh, Livermore and Argonne. And my team at Virginia Tech is one of our five other university partners where we actually care about uh, targeting uh, next generation leadership facilities. So we really do care about everything from the basics of approximation theory up to scalability. And these are not really separate concerns. Every part of the stack has to adjust so we can target these large-scale parallel devices on these large leadership facilities. Some of the applications we've looked at, uh, flow modeling, uh, computational electromagnetics. Uh, this is kind of cool. We, we worked with some researchers at the MD Anderson Cancer Center on uh, modeling a, a laser-based thermal therapy for killing cancer. So it's really grim, actually. I have slides that I have to have trigger warnings before I give them, but I haven't included them now. Uh, essentially, they are pictures of patients who are placed in an MRI. The surgeon will drill a hole in the patient's uh, head using a, a, literally a hand, hand drill and inject a, uh, or put in a uh, fiber optic catheter into the patient's brain, light it up with a laser, and it's basically like an easy bake oven where you, you bake the tumor until it's dead. Um, we brought in some uh, quantitative modeling into that process so we could actually decide what power laser should you use, how long should you use it, and where should you put the laser? So it seems like a very simple question, right? Well, this team at MD Anderson took off-the-shelf finite element codes and wrote the code. Good old finite element stuff, built, this, built the stiffness matrix, uh, started solving, and it took 12 hours to do one instance for one patient, one instance of one therapy for one patient. But if you're gonna do a design optimization for the therapy, you need hundreds of instances of uh, different potential treatments, 
So there's no way you could do that, especially what, since you want to do it live, because you're getting live data from the MRI, and you want to actually have a feedback loop to decide online how do you actually optimize this, this treatment. So we got that uh, by using GPUs. GPUs that could sit in a workstation which could sit in the booth next to the treatment, bo treatment uh, room. We got that down to 17 seconds just by accelerating the finite element solvers. There's many things that go into that, to that acceleration, but it was key to actually get the, the strongest workstations we could get. We've also done some more classical things like time-sensitive tsunami modeling, um, flow modeling. Is this one going to light up? Uh, shock modeling and uh, gas kinetic models, all sorts of things. So I am a little bit different than some of the previous speakers because my goal is this. I'm not terribly interested in actually the minutia of uh, uh, spin locks and other uh, esoteric things that you can do with OpenMP or MPI. I'm just interested in making sure my, uh, my finite element modeling tools run as fast as possible on the largest cluster we can get our hands on. Okay, so the slides should be available to you. There's a, a GitHub repo that you can access, and there's another repo we'll need later on. We'll come back to that later on. Okay, so reality check time. Myth one, how many people have heard that GPUs will make your code 100 times, or have seen results where it says the G GPU code is 100 times faster than the CPU? Have you seen this? Yeah, it's prevalent. The best I saw is 1,000 times faster. <laughs> this is, uh, and I'm sure they can edit out this later, but this is bullshit. Uh, okay, I chose the two most expensive GPUs and CPUs I could find. So very serious uh, GPU from NVIDIA, P100, Pascal class GPU, and a very expensive server chip from Intel. You can look at their specs in floating points. Uh, this thing on the left can get 10 teraflop in single precision, about half that in double precision. It's a monster. Thing on the right, a reasonable number of gigaflops, but that doesn't matter. None of that matters for most of, I talked to a number of people around here, and it does not matter for most of the applications that uh, people are doing in this room. The only thing that matters for most of the applications is the available memory bandwidth between the processor and its pool of memory. Um, this thing can achieve 732 gigabytes per second, or I've seen different numbers depending on which web page you look at. That thing over there can achieve 85 gigabytes. So it would be unreasonable to expect more than basically a factor of nine difference between the performance of the GPU and the CPU. You can forget every other number that, that, um, that uh, you're given. You can just look at the relative strength of how much data can you shovel through these processing units uh, in unit time. So now you've got to calibrate your expectations. You write your code, what should you expect? Nine times faster. Is it worth the effort that's required to convert your code to GPU to just get nine times faster? What might happen is you do that implementation and you get 100 times faster, but it tells you something. What does it tell you? What's that now? Uh, the CPU implementation was poor. The C that's, a, that's a very delicate way of putting it. <laughs> Your CPU code was shit, right? That, that's the real essence of why people are seeing a thousand times speed up. It doesn't even mean the GPU code was much good either. You could have a bad CPU code, a really bad CPU code, and a, an okay or a mediocre GPU implementation, the ratio could still be large, right? But if you've got the, the CPU code pro properly uh, tuned and you create a properly tuned GPU code, you're going to see maybe a factor of nine at best. Now, these are peak bandwidths. Usually, it's very difficult to get to peak bandwidth. You're going to get some fraction of peak bandwidth. On the P100, we're having a hard time beating much more than 50 to 60% of peak bandwidth. On the uh, CPU, we can get close to peak bandwidth. There are reasons for that to do with the cache hierarchy. 
So 60% of 732 versus 85. Really, we're talking more realistically, we can expect like a factor of five difference between your CPU code and your GPU code. So you know, all expectations aside, you shouldn't really expect 100 times speed up. You're really gonna see closer to five. GPUs are expensive. Well, they are if you buy the professional class, uh, server class GPUs. Uh, that thing on the left, $5,000 at least. The thing on the right, though, I, I rigged this game. I found the most expensive Intel CPU I could find, which is a $9,000 piece, <laughs> right? If you took a slightly less, uh, uh, one of the models with less onboard cache, and you look at the ratio of the performance of this versus one of the slightly cheaper, like a $1,500 card, or CPU, sorry, then the rate, that, that dollar amount for the GPU is very carefully calibrated so that the dollars you pay for the GPU are roughly the same as the dollars you would pay for equivalent CPU performance. So the one device will give you four or five times faster, but it might cost you four to five times as much. So then the question is, what are we doing here? Why, don't, why not use your CPU? Uh, just use more CPUs. There are some advantages to thinking about GPUs, and we'll talk about those. Myth number three, CPUs and GPUs are very different. And I've got some die shots, one for the NVIDIA P100 and one for that monster Intel CPU. Um, kind of looks like flyover country when you go flyover and you see the fields and there's just field after field. Um, but if we look at the actual architecture, they are really not that different. The GPU has 56 cores. NVIDIA will give you marketing speech and tell you it's a streaming multiprocessor, by which they mean core. Um, each core has um, four, I think it's two or four, I can't remember the exact number, 32 ways, sim, sim, they call it SIMT, which may they mean SIMD, SIMD units. Um, so it's basically 32 wide vector units. The, um, I've been told I should use the pointer so I can capture on here. Um, I was getting a stern look from up there. Uh, the CPU, on the other hand, it has 24 cores, and they have 256-bit wide AVX2 instructions. So they also have wide vector instructions, not as wide, but by and large, it's not that different a system. The architecture is really not that different. 56 cores on the left, 24 cores on the right. Uh, four 32 wide vector, which if you multiply by um, 32 bits, that's a wider vector unit, so it's a 1,024 bit unit versus 256 bit uh, SIMD units, vector units, right? Really, they are not that different. There are some differences. Myth number four. OpenACC is magic. You've, you've had that uh, OpenACC lecture now, and you've had the hands-on. And essentially, the, the suggestion is that you can add directives to your code, and it will magically fully exploit the GPU. My, my Actual experience and observation with OpenACC is, first of all, the compilers are not mature yet. My favorite error, favorite compiler error is, um, what was that? Oh, compiler has experienced a catastrophic error. <laughs> That's very helpful. And it really, you know, it's, it's hard to, to figure out what, what to do after that, but, um, So, I'm not a huge fan of OpenACC, but not for the reasons that uh, Tim talked about yes, yesterday. He was talking about a territorial dispute, right? OpenACC committee versus OpenMP committee. I'm more about the program programmability. And I'm thinking, okay, so I have to have a directive to move data and one part of the code, and I have to have a directive that makes the data operations, the, the operations you want to do, 
uh, happen on the GPU in a different part of the code, and I've got, to I've got to coordinate those things over a massive code base. And I have to remember that those directives are merely suggestions, and the compiler can choose to ignore my suggestions at any point. So I'm a control freak. It doesn't give me enough control. The best OpenACC codes typically have come out of re-engineering existing CUDA codes, where you take a CUDA code which already has the type of offload we'll talk about later, and then you just change the syntax and you awkwardly program CUDA but by using OpenACC directives. Those are the codes that have proved to be uh, reasonably performant. There are some, ex there's one thing that was kind of interesting though, is when I taught OpenACC to some undergrads, um, it was a bit of a train wreck because of the compiler issues. But there was one instance where OpenACC could do a better job than my native CUDA programming would do. And that was in a reduction. Because, because you're basically saying do a reduction via a, a directive, OpenACC can reach into its bag of tricks which are prepackaged reduction operations and it could produce a, an efficient reduction that I could not match because the, the NVIDIA guys behind OpenACC or PGI had, had done a better job at that implementation. Myth number 4.1, CUDA is magic. Uh, even if you bend over backwards to write your CUDA code, there's no guarantee you're gonna get anywhere near, near peak performance. Um, you, it can take a great deal of psychoanalyzing the, the CUDA compilers to, and the architecture to, to get best performance. So. It takes more than three hours to master GPUs. We'll discuss some of the basics. There are many web resources. Nothing beats hands-on, and I'll add some background to what Nikolai talked about. So let's talk about, so any questions about that? And remember, that's all opinion. That's my opinion. Your mileage may vary uh, based on your ex own personal experience and journey. What about batch per flow, the, the ratio? We'll talk about that. I have actual numbers. Ridiculously high number of uh, flops per byte are required. But I'll talk about that. That's a good question. Anything else? Okay. So let's, let's talk about this at the 10,000 foot level, which is um, CPU. What's the main driver of, of CPU design? Originally, it was the supremacy of a thread. You wanted the thread to be uninterrupted and as high performance as possible. This comes from the day where you had single core, single threaded machines, right? So the goal there was to make single threads very fast, reduce latency through large caches, use uh, prediction speculation for the instruction stream, okay? So you wanted to, to guard against branches in the instruction stream. And if you looked at sort of an abstract representation of a CPU architecture, you have not just an instruction fetch decode unit, um, you also have a good amount of silicon devoted to out of order control logic, branch prediction logic. You have uh, extensive uh, silicon devoted to memory prefetch and caching. Um, and you uh, maybe had a limited number of arithmetic logic units that are actually doing the, the floating point uh, algebra. So that was just to make sure one thread was, didn't stall and achieved high performance. The GPU application, the original application, was rendering games for uh, basically teenagers as, with as many polygons as fast as possible, the highest frame rate. So it's a very competitive industry. Originally you had ATI and NVIDIA. We were competing in the uh, GPU space. Um, the rendering purpose, the process is very, very, very simple in a sense. Every pixel, you can see, I can see pixels, you probably can't, I'll have a blow up in a second. We have to make decisions about the red, green, blue intensity for those little blocks in the screen. And it's a massively in parallel task because you can choose those red, green, blue intensities for this pixel over here versus this pixel over here. They can be done independently. So you have a potential on a, a thousand by a thousand uh, display of doing a million operations simultaneously. So if you zoom in, you can see obviously the pixels. We need to choose the color. We need to do it at 60 uh, frames per second. And you need to do it on a modern display at 4K resolution. 
So if you take 4K by 2K, that's 8 million pixels uh, at at least 60 frames per second. That's a lot. That's like half a billion pixel decisions you have to make every second. So you need some serious parallel processing behind the scenes. And here's an example, a more modern example of, let's say, Fallout 4. So this screen is a rendered set of triangles. Each triangle has an image, a texture associated with it. And when we, uh, as the viewer, need to decide what color this pixel is going to be, then uh, there's some projective geometry, some rotations, some interpolation required. So there's a, an enormous amount of uh, arithmetic, floating point arithmetic, that needs to be done to make a decision on how those pixels should be colored. So what are the design goals? Throughput matters. Single threads do not matter. So you can think of a CPU as the embodiment of capitalism. It's all about the individual, or Americanism, right? It's all about that's getting that single consumer to, con to keep consuming without interruption. The GPU is more like communism, where the collection, the collective, is important. You need to get all pixels colored. Uh, X times, 60 times a second, right? So throughput matters. Single threads do not. It doesn't matter in which order you color those pixels. As long as they're all color colored within 1 60th of a second, we're good to go. That's the game, you're good to go. Um, they recognize you have to deal with memory latency, and we can do that by massive parallelism. So we oversubscribe the processing elements in each of these of the GPU cores. Um, by having more, than, more threads than we have processors, in essence. Um, one of the best things NVIDIA ever did was let the programmer deal with the raw storage hierarchy. So the early GPUs were not friendly uh, devices to program. They had very little in the way of cache. And what cache they had was programmer managed. So when you program the CPU, you don't really directly interact with the caches. On the GPU, they're exposed. Well, originally they were exposed. So you decide when to fetch data into cache. So you were doing that, that uh, work yourself as a programmer. And they didn't, they didn't fall into the same trap as AMD and Intel did in uh, CPU clock speed. They didn't keep ramping up the speed or the frequency of the chips just to get better performance because you run into thermal problems. Instead, they made them more parallel rather than faster. So here's an early example of a GPU. Um, I like this because if you look at it, almost all of the space on this uh, chip is processing. All that sim all those SIMD cores, those are all the vector units that are doing, that are computing those pixel intensities. Even the cache does arithmetic. So when you say, I'd like to get the, the um, texture value between, which is the image pixels on, for each triangle, I will say, I want to have the pixel value, and it's going to be between pixels in the image on that triangle. It will actually do that arithmetic in cache. So everything in here is a worker. So it's the, it's the communist ideal. It's all workers, very little management, and they're all working, striving towards that same goal. On the right, we have a floor pan from an early uh, sort of a vintage 2008 single core CPU. And if you look, almost everything here is management. Data management, cache, instruction management. The only thing that's actually doing the work is that floating point unit at the bottom left. If, in terms of uh, HPC computational science, the only worker is the oversubscribed floating point unit at the bottom left. So I like to think of this as sort of the university, the university system. You have the president, the provost, the vice provost, the uh, deans, the associate deans, the department chairs, the faculty, and who gets to do the work? Grad students. <laughs> so how do they get there? Right? They blew out the management on the, on the, C, on the GPU core. They got rid of the instruction, uh, the branch predictors, the prefetch units, they got rid of the cache. They stripped it down to just the instruction units, their arithmetic logic units doing the arithmetic, and some uh, registers to put that data in. Um, and then since we have to do this on a bunch of pixels, 
will have to have a bunch of these lightweight cores. But GPU rendering, working on this pixel here and this pixel here, you do the same, se same sequence of operations, right? It's all the same projective geometry. So instead of having 16 independent stre uh, instructional streams, let's unify those instructional streams. And in this case, I've just got eight because I could only fit eight on my chart. So I have eight, in eight one instruction stream, one instruction fetch to code unit feeding eight arithmetic logic units and they share some execution context, so registers, for instance. Now, because uh, we're having to deal with memory hierarchies, we'll end up having uh, threads that stall, as, or the instruction streams will stall as you try and feed the ALUs, because you can push, pump through operations quite quickly. Um, we're gonna have multiple contexts, so that, that means a large register file, so you can have multiple sets of uh, data for threads that can be co-resident with the, the core. And because these are lightweight cores, you can then duplicate those cores and have multiple cores per GPU, okay? So, it looks rather like a CPU, except, and we'll talk about, we'll get to the main difference, but essentially, every operation on the GPU core is parallel. On the CPU core, we have that decision the compiler has to actually be persuaded that an operation is not just a serial operation, but it's an operation that can be vectorized. At the core, every operation on the GPU is vectorized. There is no alternative. There's only one instruction stream and it gets on each core and it gets pushed through the vector units. So that's an abstract model. Here's a real model of a Maxwell that's not the current, but previous generation GPU. And you can see I'm not too far off in, in the structure I'm suggesting. We have each one of these things as a core. I've got a blow up of one of them. This is the core, and here's the blow up of the core. NVIDIA would like to make you think that each of the arithmetic logic units in that core is a core, because it's marketing speak, because they can say they have 3,000 some cores on a GPU, because that sounds a lot more than Intel's claim of having 16 cores on a GPU. So there's marketing speak involved. What they actually have, in this case, are four SIMD vector units. So it's like a core with four sub-cores, okay? Now, as to answer the question, uh, so in this case, we have 16 cores, each have four SIMD clusters with 32 ALUs, and the data streams at 56 gigafloats, and the peak is 4.6 teraflops. So if you want to get peak performance, you take 4.6 teraflops and you divide by 56 gigafloats, and that tells you how many operations you have to do per float load or store in order to get peak performance. And it's, what is that, 80? Something like that? I can't do that arithmetic in my head, but um, I'm a very slow single core processor. <laughs> But that basically tells you, if you want to hit those headline peak numbers, you're gonna to have to do a vast amount of arithmetic on every time you load one float or store one float, which is unobtainable. But on the other hand, this thing can stream 56 gigafloats per second, which is a great deal more than most CPUs can stream. And since our operations are mostly bandwidth limited, we're concerned about that peak rate, not the flop rate. So just let me emphasize the fundamental difference between a CPU and GPU. I said they're not too dissimilar, but there are, so there's a striking difference, which is, this is a, a core diagram from uh, the execution unit inside an uh, Intel core. It's got lots of different units in there, and the problem is that it's got both vector operations and it's got scalar operations. And you have to persuade the compiler, by hook or by crook, that an operation should be a vector operation. And it has to satisfy some criterion. Basically, it has to satisfy that the data that you're using is aligned in memory in a certain way. That's, that's a pretty big restriction. Um, and it's eligible to be handled by a vector operation because there are multiple ways you could perform the operation. So the compiler is typically gonna be very cautious, and so you really have to strong arm it through intrinsics or through directives, and you have to really 
punish it or even that level of assembler, you have to really be firm with the compiler to persuade it to do a vector operation. The GPU, and one of the reasons it might be easier to get speed up when you go to the GPU is you do not have to be so forceful with the compiler to make an operation a vector operation because by default all operations are vector operations. You have no choice. There are no scalar processes on the GPU core. And the other difference is if you look at the number of registers available to the core, the CPU core doesn't have that many registers on the order of 100. The GPU core has thousands of registers. Now, 16,000 registers seems like a lot for a core, but divide by the number of arithmetic logic units, and you actually find that the number of registers is not that large. And there's a problem that we don't, because we're going to have to deal with the um, latency, the memory latency of the GPU core to <coughs> communicate to the GPU memory, we have a problem that um, we want to have not just, in this case, 128 threads res resident, but we'll want to have a multiple of that resident so we can switch context between threads that have data and threads that don't have data. So 16K sounds like a lot, but it is not as many as we'd hope. So just to summarize, GPU has multiple cores, and each core has one or more wi uh, wide, so 32 wide SIMD vector units. They, the SIMD units execute one instructional stream. It has a pool of shared memory, which I didn't mention yet, but it's a scratch pad, so all threads that resident on a single core can access that shared memory. It shares a register file uh, privately among all the arithmetic logic units, and it's able to fast switch in single digit uh, cycles, switch between different threads. So we can go from active threads to inactive, uh, to other threads, ready threads. Because we've got, um, because it's essentially a vector processor at the core, um, branching involves serialization. So there are some downsides to this basic model of, of everything's a vector operation. Okay, so that's the architecture. Any questions about that? Yes. Um, do you see any convergence between what Intel's doing with their Xeon flies and the GPUs? Yeah, absolutely. So they're going towards the same spot? Absolutely. And we're converging to the number of fabs. So the manufacturers who are able to produce chips uh, in successive generations is decreasing. So eventually we're going to be down to just a couple of fabs that can produce these chips and the convergence is natural. There's, and of course you can get these hybrid uh, GPU CPUs which have CPU cores and GPU cores. So you can even converge on a single, uh, single chip. So sometimes when you want a CPU that can, is very good at uh, scalar operations, sometimes you want a, a GPU which is very good at vector operations. So if your application needs that, then that's a good option. Any other questions? That was a good one. I'm not losing you, right? I've sort of given you the basics. It, it's, you can see the convergence of these, of these architectures. I've highlighted just a couple of the main differences. These are the biggest differences and why we see some of the biggest performance differences. Memory bandwidth, automatic vectorize, uh, vectorization is the, 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 the uh, basic operation, or vector operations are basic operations, and a larger number of registers per core. How did we get there? So I showed you a fairly mature GPU. Uh, if we go back just a couple of generations, the Fermi core, the core was a sort of simpler um, core with 32 uh, arithmetic logic units. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, GPUs, oddly enough. You start after a while getting a favorite architecture, then they change it on you. And they went from 32 floating point units to 192 floating point units per core. And there's a reason for that because NVIDIA's core um, business is selling GPUs to teenagers. The Fermi class GPU was designed more for general purpose compute. So somehow, NVIDIA Research managed to steer the architecture decision on Fermi so that it was actually better balanced for compute. The pendulum swung the other way with this uh, Kepler class where they wanted just a huge number of floating point units so that uh, the graphics performance was better. So this was not the best card. Um, 
basically because you had 192 floating point units, but the number of registers available wasn't, uh, wasn't commensurately increased. Uh, shared memory wasn't uh, increased, so it's sort of just they over-provision the floating point units. Maxwell, the pendulum swings back the other way a little bit. Uh, you don't have as many floating point units, and I think the, the shared memory uh, relative to the, the number of floating point units increased. And now here we are today with Pascal, soon to be Volta, um, where if the, there are so many floating point units that you can barely distinguish them. Um, we're at 3,000 some floating point units, which still, from my perspective as a computational scientist who wants to actually do memory bound work, that's, that's, there are too many. But what's more interesting, and this is why the Pascal generation is a sea change in terms of what NVIDIA is producing, is the ratio between single precision cores and double precision cores. So if you look, these orange boxes, they are 64-bit floating point uh, ALUs, floating point units. So there's a ratio of two to one, which is the best ratio we've had so far on NVIDIA's architecture. And um, for uh, hardcore, um, computations, we care about double precision, so you can actually forget the single precision units are there, if you want to. And the, the balance between a number of double precision floating point units and the available bandwidth, which is on this device, is almost up to a teraflop, of, uh, ter terabyte, sorry, of data that can be streamed a second, um, that's actually a pretty good ratio. So this thing can generate about five ter teraflop performance, and it, um, and the, it can stream about a terabyte of data. So that ratio is actually getting better, back to the point that was raised earlier about the number of operations you need to do per load or store. So this thing is expensive, but it's a really nice processor. It's also the first uh, version of the GPU which came in at 16 nanometer. So it's really uh, interesting. Uh, you can buy a consumer version for 600 bucks as opposed to the professional version, which is 6,000 bucks. And the only difference is it doesn't have as many uh, double, precision core, uh, double precision arithmetic logic units activated. So it will get much less uh, double precision floating performance, but the single precision, if you, if you can get away with single precision, you can buy the consumer device, and it's a very, very powerful device. Whew. So we've seen an evolution just in the time I've been working. So I started working on these GPUs about 2007, 2008, as soon as CUDA was invented. And they've gone from fairly modest cores, which had two eight-wide eight um, SIMD units, up to 192 and back down. So uh, I think it's fair to say that this Pascal class GPU is probably the first GPU that has the potential to really uh, make a meaningful difference to a lot of the applications that, you know, I was looking at the, the, the pages outside, and I was thinking a lot of, the, a lot of the, the projects you're working on, they would actually probably map very well to this architecture, the new Pascal architecture. Okay, any questions about that? You see the progression. Now, what has stabilized in that progression is the SIMD width. They're 32 wide vector units that they've stuck with. They started with eight wide, now they're at 32 wide, and that's been the case for several generations. So in terms of tuning a code, we haven't had to make major changes in the way that our codes are written for those devices in several years. How did we program them? That's the next question. Um, so we're gonna talk about CUDA. Compute unified, unified Device Architecture, which is one of the worst acronyms. Um, it's laced with terminology from weaving, um, like warp, thread, and texture, and I hate the terminology because I can never can remember which is which. It's also a very bad analogy. So my wife is actually, uh, has a loom of her own, a little portable loom, and you string up the, the threads so that um, this is one direction in the cloth, and then in, to, in order to make the orthogonal direction, you pass a shuttle which has a thread attached to it through the loom, and you just repeat that backwards and forwards until you've actually created the two-dimensional fabric. 
what is the problem of thinking of this as a good analogy for parallel computing? What's that now? You're going perpendicular to the threads when you actually do work. You're going perpendicular to the threads, and it's an inherently serial process, right? If you start the thread here, the, the cross thread, you literally are visiting the threads in order. So it's the worst analogy you can imagine for parallel computing because it's an inherently serial process, right? Okay, so, right, so I'm gonna refer to thread arrays and SIMD groups and, and, and talk about uh, vector parallelism, not really linger with the, the, the only thing I'm gonna keep from that whole thing is thread. Okay, so CUDA came along in 2007. Um, you can Google for CUDA and you'll find lots and lots of stuff online. And um, when it started, there was really not much, but there was a lot of information from developers, formed a lot of forums over the years, and, and that's how the community grew until NVIDIA pretty much abandoned CUDA developers uh, when they realized that they could just go with independent software vendors instead of working with the community directly. They're trying to court people through OpenACC now, but I, I expect they will abandon that community as soon enough when they just focus on something else. NVIDIA has the attention of a gadfly. I mean, they really, <laughs> today it's artificial intelligence. Uh, previously it was uh, DNA. Previously, you know, they, they just change their focus all the time. So be very careful how much you invest in um, this, but it's a good way to think about how you program this, these GPUs. So this is a typical GPU, it's a discrete GPU. It's basically a computer on a board, that's the processor, that's the interface to the motherboard which it sits in. It has its own memory. So I, I put this up because it's very, it's very important to have the right mental model of what a GPU is, or a discrete GPU. So when we want to allocate an array on the device, we're gonna to have to go through the CUDA API. We're gonna to have to, instead of doing a malloc, we're gonna say CUDA malloc, because we want to basically make sure that we've allocated bytes, storage, on the device, which literally means reserving bytes on the memory on the board. Next step, we're gonna copy data from the host, if, assuming you need some input data for your algorithm. We're gonna copy it over the PCI Express interface or with the latest GPUs over the MVLink interface. We're gonna queue up a task on a device, and I make that, I'm very careful to say we're not gonna run a kernel, we're actually literally going to queue up a device, uh, queue, on, queue up a task on the device, because it's an asynchronous compute device. It has its own instruction stream, separate from the, what we call a host, right? Host is going through its set of instructions, device goes through its set of instructions, and we, when we say run a kernel on the device, we're saying please at your future convenience, run a kernel. And then once it's done, we'll copy the data back from the device to the host using CUDA mem copy. So that's three things we're gonna have to figure out. CUDA malloc, CUDA mem copy, and how to run a kernel, and how to write the kernel for the device. Does that make sense? Three things, that's all we need to know. Somehow this is difficult, but it isn't. It's fairly straightforward. You have to remember those three things. CUDA malloc, CUDA memcopy, and running a kernel. Now we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to make some decisions. We've got this massively parallel device. It has 16 cores, say. Each core is gonna have 128 floating point units. We're gonna have to decide how to split up our task amongst the cores and amongst the uh, vector units on those cores. That's where we actually have to invent a, invest a little bit of mental energy to figure out what to do there. So we're gonna have to first of all decide how do we break down our overall task into tasks that can map onto this parallel architecture. So let's say you have to do three matrix vector multiplies and they're independent. Well, then you're gonna have three separate tasks. Now with each matrix vector, uh, operation, you're gonna to have to break down that matrix vector operation into independent subtasks. So you can imagine doing a block, a row block, as one task block times vector multiply, right? And then that would go to one core, 
next row block, take a chunk of rows times the vector, that can be sent to another core. Okay? So we have to think about the partitioning of the parallel task. It's not so dissimilar from MPI or even OpenMP. Now, when we've done that block, de block partitioning, now we have to decide how are we going to process that block times that vector, but distributing those operations to the SIMD units on those cores? So that's the hierarchy we have to think about. Partitioning in the core scale, independent operations, which are fairly large operations. Then taking each of those large operations and subdividing them into also separate operations that then at the finest scale, we'll partition into small lightweight operations that won't take many registers. Because remember, our register file is large, but it's not large relative to number of processing elements. And there's some details, but that's too much to absorb. So here's the first piece of CUDA code you might see. If hopefully, you haven't seen this before, because otherwise, you're very, very bored. Hopefully, surfing the web. Good. OK, so I know there's some CUDA people in here, and I uh, apologize. Um, so just to uh, reiterate the sequence of events, which almost every CUDA program follows, we're going to allocate some space, some, an array on the device. And because it's outside of the memory space of the host, we're going to make a specific call to CUDA malloc, which is a CUDA API call. And we basically say, Oh, well, the good thing is we can use regular pointers, and we're going to do a CUDA malloc. So this says, give it the address of that pointer so it can change the pointer and say how many bytes you want to use. That's not too difficult. If you've seen malloc, and I apologize if you haven't, poor Fortran people hate me right now. Uh, uh, if you've uh, used a malloc or a calloc, you can understand what this does. Let's skip this part, which is the actual pro uh, running the program on the core, and I'll tell you what we're going to do. So here, I should have said what we're doing. We're just doing a simple kernel. It's going to allocate an array on the device. This thing is going to fill the entries of that array. And then we're going to copy the array back to the host. And in this case, the host has to allocate some space to receive the data. Then we're going to use a CUDA memcopy. Just, it's a straightforward and analog, uh, it's analogous to the regular standard library memcopy. And you say, I want to copy from the device to the host this many bytes. And you tell CUDA what you want to do. And finally, once the data's on the host, you're ready to print out the data. Does that make sense? So the thing I skipped over is this part here, where we're going to invoke a kernel, or queue a kernel on the device. This will be its name. We have to say something about how we want to partition the problem. And we're going to give it some input arguments. So it looks like a, a funky function, right? It's a function with some baggage. Kind of looks like templating, but it isn't, not, not strictly. Um, these are, and then we'll see, this is not standard C. So we're going to have to use the NVIDIA CUDA compiler to actually process and to compile up this code, because it understands what this syntax means. What we're saying is I want to queue up B. Oh, sorry, uh, yes, I'm going to break the problem so that on each core, I want to queue up 512 threads, OK? Roughly speaking, what it's saying. And then I'm going to choose enough uh, core tasks or thread blocks so that I'm going to have one thread per entry in this array. So if I took a, uh, what did I say? Three, oh, wish, I wish I'd chosen an easy number. But um, if you take 3,789 divided by 512 and round up, that's how many blocks of threads I'm going to request. So I'm going to have enough threads that I can set one entry in. Each thread can set one entry in that array. Does that make sense? Yeah? It's just a block partitioning of a loop. And we'll see what I mean by that in a moment. OK. So to reiterate, we use CUDA malloc to allocate space on the device. We're going to specify how many threads we want. Yes? Uh, can you catch the thread that runs on the, G, uh, on the GPU so that you can do other stuff on the CPU and then get notified when the GPU is done? That's a fantastic question. Did I already answer that question? 
Yes, what did I say previously? It's asynchronous. It's already detached. It's a, it's a thread. It's, we're requesting that that kernel gets launched and it returns without guaranteeing the, the kernel has finished. The question to that example, how does the main code know that the kernel is done when you copy the uh, answer back? Because the one thing I didn't tell you is that the CUDA mem copy is blocking. It's we're actually queuing up a memory copy request. We're adding that after the kernel. So the kernel has to complete before that copy will start. Yep, does that make sense? Yep, but I try not to throw all the details in at the same time, but it's very astutely uh, observed. Does that make sense to people? Basically, there's a queue on the device, and in this case, we're using a default queue, and we've queued in that kernel operation, and after that, we've queued in that copy operation. It's possible to overlap those things, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay, so we're going to queue up that task, and when this returns, we have no, no, we do not know what the status of this, of uh, the device is. It's sort of doing its thing, right? But by queuing up this copy, we are putting it into the queue on the device, and that has to finish before that will happen. Now let's see, before I go straight into the syntax for how we code up the kernel, let's start with a simple kernel written in serial C. So here's a simple example. I've somehow managed to forget the type of the, the integer n. So this is int n, and I'm just going to loop over from 0 to n minus 1 and set the entry to be equal to the, the loop index. Pretty, pretty easy, right? We're going to do some loop tiling, and we're going to partition this. In this case, I've got n is 20. I'm going to say partition n into blocks of four. So we'll have five blocks of four iterations each. Does this make sense? Because I have to figure out how to take that long vector and chop that task into subtasks that can be sent in whole to a core. Right? Because we have this two-level parallelism, cores and threads running on vector units. So I have to figure out, manually figure this out. So if I was to write the code, I would say for block equals 0 to grid dim minus 1, someone should complain at this point. What's the complaint? Grid dim is where is it defined? It gets defined at the launch where you say how many blocks I want. That's defined in grid dim. So there's a, there's a sort of a code separation problem. The launch decides the outer bounds of that block loop. And it decides the outer, it, it determines the, out, the limit of that inner loop too. So it feels like those limits came from nowhere. But when you launch the kernel, those upper bounds get defined for you. OK? So just to recap, by, in this, by setting this dimensional grid, this is going to define the upper bound for the block loop. And this will define the, for the number of blocks, this will define the uh, upper bound for the inner loop. Right? Does that make sense? That's the thing I've been teaching GPU programming for, I don't know, since 2008, literally. That's the thing that messes with people's heads, is that you specify the loop bounds outside of the kernel, and they magically appear inside the kernel. And people don't like it when stuff magically appears in code. Right? OK, so we're tiling that loop. Now, since we've tiled it, we need to reconstruct our linear index based on the thread number in the block and the block number, because we have to count along. I'm in this block. I'm this thread in this block, so I know where I might, where my, what my place is in the order of things. Right? Is that the only map that I could have chosen? No, I just needed a one-to-one -one map. 
basically, this is the task I want to do, the iterate, n. And I could have chosen any map between the thread and the block to into n. So I could have had a crazy map between the thread on the block and the index as long as there was one to one. That means that there's not two threads pointing at the same, at the same n, right? So that's for, we've had to think, I'm implicitly building a parallelism in here. I've done a blocking and then a sub uh, partition of each block of task, right? Okay, so we're still working in serial though. Now, another idiosyncrasy of CUDA is it provides the thread index for you. The T and B and my previous thing, the, the, the keywords you need are thread IDX, block IDX. They tell you what the index are for the thread and the block. It's basically analogous to using an MPI rank, right? Except it's a two-dimensional rank. But notice, we're not defining them. They get given to us. They're, they're, they're variables that appear out of nowhere. Okay? Which, again, is very difficult to, uh, to, to get your head around. So there's going to be a, a loop over thread idx.x. Thread idx.x is less than block dim dogs. I mean, it's a pain to read it out. But it's just a change of variable names. Okay? Oh, yeah, what, that's a good question. So notice down here at the bottom, I have an if statement. Where the hell did the if statement come from? Why do I have an if statement there? Here's a clue. What happens if the, your uh, array is, a, is of length, which is a, a prime number? A large prime number. It doesn't tile neatly, right? So we always guard because we may have to over-provision, create more threads than there are entries in the array, right? So if you'll see, look at CUDA codes, you'll see these checks everywhere, even though you think, oh, that's just, why is there a check there? Okay. Messy, a little bit, right? But it's still serial code. But almost every CUDA code has this structure. Now what's gonna happen is every iteration of this inner loop is gonna be mapped to a thread every iteration of the outer loop is going to be mapped to a block of threads, right? So we don't really need to have those for loops there at all. All we need to do is say what each thread, what a thread is going to do based on its thread rank and its block rank. Or the only code we really need is this thing here. Does that make sense? We strip away the loop structure and replace it with threads that do every iteration in the loop structure. So we'll have for every iteration, there's a thread. Ooh. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But basically we start with this, which looks like a tiled serial simple kernel. And then we really mess with your head by just giving you the inner part of that double tile, that single, that tiled uh, for loop. Because that's the only piece that matters to a thread, what it does. Does that make sense? Right, you don't need those for loops because we're not iterating in an index space in a traditional sense. We've tiled the index space with threads. So if I have <coughs> 1,024 long vector, and I'm gonna use 32 threads in a block, and I'm gonna need 32 blocks, then I'll actually launch 1,024 threads, and each thread will be responsible for updating one value in the index, one value in the array, okay? If you can grok that, you know how to program CUDA, right? You have to design the partition of your loops in your problem, and just encode what happens inside the innermost part of that loop. So it's, it's a sort of a really unpleasant thing because we're, we're using these intrinsic thread index, block index, block dim variables that appear out of nowhere. It's sort of awkward, right? In MPI, we ask what our rank is. 
we explicitly say, what's my rank? And then based on our rank, what we decide what to do. Well, here we just have to use these thread indexes which, and block indexes, which tell us what our rank is. Okay. Does that make sense? I paused a little bit, took a little bit longer. Yes? Uh, for a given n, uh, is the best uh, grid dimension and the block dimension can be derived by a compiler or something, or we have to specify? We design it. Uh -huh. We have to decide. When we launch, yeah, but if we know the n number already, then and depends on the hardware. Maybe there's there's a best performance value for the V, right? Well, oh, excellent question. Uh -huh. And why can our compiler decide it for us? It may not be easily decidable. It could be a very hard question to answer, which means you would have to scan through all the possible thread block sizes. It's a very complicated question because the number of registers depends on how you partition the task. If you partition into a small number of threads in a thread block, you might need many registers or you might need a few. It, it depends. So what you've asked is actually a deep question, which is how do you tune a GPU code for best performance? And one of the things is you need to pay attention to how those threads, thread blocks get mapped to those vector units. So. Having a thread block count, which is a multiple of 32, is usually a good start. Because we, what happens when you map this, this task to the, the GPU core is it gets sliced into groups of 32. So I've got 512 threads in my block, but that gets sliced into groups of 32. So 512 divided by 32 is, what, 16? So what will happen is the instructions for those 512 threads will get um, split into 16 groups of 32 behind the scenes for you. So what would be a very bad choice for the block size? Thirty-three. That's that's actually not the worst choice. What's the worst choice? One, right? That's what you said, right? One. Why is one a very bad choice for block size? Vectorized process, so you need large number of threads that are running concurrently in the streaming multiprocessor. Specifically, we have 32 units, and if you put one thread in a thread block, that one thread is going to be very lonely because it's going to occupy one lane in a 32 wide vector unit. So it's like the roads in, I used to live in Houston. You know, they used to be four wide, then they were six wide, and then they, they'll, eventually there'll be 16 wide uh, highways going into Houston, right? Or going out. And the analogy is you send one car down one lane, right? Really what you want is 16 cars or multiples of 16 cars so that you can have 16 across. And the way that traffic is in Houston, that's usually how it is. Now. The difference in Houston is that those 16 cars that are running down the 16 wide uh, highway, they run at different rates, right? They're not working in lockstep. In, in the GPU model, you'd have the 16 cars going abreast. They would be going at, down the highway at the same rate, right? They go in lockstep. But the worst case, as pointed out, is if you just have one car. That means you've only got one lane in your SIMD unit being, occup uh, being occupied which as a commuter would be ideal. You have all this space around you. But in terms of throughput, that's the worst usage of the road. Okay? Right. Does that make sense? So I linger a little bit on this one because this is the basic concept. If you get that, you've got 50% of what you need for GPU programming. So again, it's just loop tiling. We have to design a loop tile the maps from some, let's say, a linear index space into a partitioned index space. The variables that appear out of nowhere are the thread rank in the block and the block rank in the grid. So there's the grid of blocks, the blocks, and then inside the blocks you have the threads, right? And to get those, you can use these intrinsic variables, thread IDX, block dim, block IDX, and grid dim tells you how many blocks there are on the grid. And these are three-dimensional indices. 
because the GPU is designed for uh, rendering, picture, pic yeah, rendering those pictures, uh, the natural uh, thread rank for uh, a thread is actually a two-dimensional thread rank. So the earlier version of CUDA, they would give you an X and a Y location of pixels. Um, well, X and Y of threads. Um, but now we've got three-dimensional uh, ranks. So you can actually do three-dimensional. In fact, you can have three dimensionals in the block, three-dimensional in the thread. There are some limits on those uh, dimensions of those, uh, the, the array of blocks and the array of threads, but that's too much data to take on, take on board. Okay, so that's the kernel. There's some extra syntax that I didn't linger on. Um, the kernel is indicated in the source file with underscore, un they like underscores. Underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore. Okay? Um, so that says that that's going to be a kernel code. We can use the intrinsic variables to figure out what our index in our problem is. And this is the actual action that's going to be performed by each thread. That seems ridiculously small task for a thread. But in some sense, the sweet spot for a GPU kernel is one that doesn't take very many registers, which is actually a small number of operations. Because you, you aren't just fitting the register variables for this thread onto the, the core. Um, you're fitting the register variables for many, many instances. Um, I think I've covered that. So I think it would be good to just do a hands-on right now. So the first thing you need to do is uh, SSH to Cooley. Are you, are you all being able to use Cooley this week, or is this a first? Pardon? One node, okay. So yes, we've, we've generously provisioned you with one node on uh, each on Cooley. So you should SSH in, and you're going to Q sub. I think this is correct for the Q sub command. Uh, it worked for me, so if it worked for me, it's probably going to work for you. Talk you which I better get on there. Um, and so if you can just follow these instructions, hopefully I've got them right. It's just going through the process of one, getting a compute node. Two, um, well, first of all, clone the repository with the examples. Secondly, get the compute node. Third, finding the source code for a simple, the simple example, and then compiling it, and then running it. And you'll see we have to use the NVIDIA C com or CUDA compiler. We don't strictly have to, but for this example, we will be using it. And then running it, you run it like it's a normal executable. So I'll be passing around. Uh, if you have any questions or problems, please raise your hand. That wasn't difficult, right? Well, it wasn't difficult because I gave you the code. But if you look at the code, it is logical in the sense that as soon as you dis realize you have to partition up a problem into blocks and then subpartition the blocks, everything else sort of flows through. How about we just try one example in the next 57 seconds before the break um, where instead of using that index where I said, uh, the n equals t plus b times dimensional block, why don't you try reversing what each block does? So instead of going from zero to, wow. Does everyone want to see what I mean? Um, so here we've created an arbitrary map between the thread index and thread rank and block rank into our index space. You can either choose to reverse it based on just inside the thread block, or you can reverse it over the whole grid, right? You choose how you'd like to do that. But just to drill home the point that we're deciding how to map from thread index and block index into the index space. So the thing I want you to do is modify the CUDA code so that you change the sequence or the map between the thread index and the array index. Does that make sense? Okay, so give that a try. Okay, so I'm asked to repeat. So here we've, we've created an, a simple map. So thread zero, block zero, maps to th index zero. Thread uh, one, block zero, maps to thread uh, to index one. I'm saying you could reverse that ordering. And so I could say thread zero, uh, index, thread zero, block zero, uh, 
could map to the last entry in the array. So you could try that. Or if you're feeling particularly brave, you can just reverse the ordering within the thread block. Okay? Just be careful that you get your if statement right. So you just want to make sure that your index is still a valid index. Especially if you reverse the array, because then you'll have to check to see if the index is greater than zero or something like that, right? Greater than or equal to zero. Uh, during the break, very good question, which was, can I recommend any books? And I don't recommend any books, because they're of varying quality. There are a number of CUDA books that are out now. Um, this might be one of the most widely used books. So if you need a text, you might consider using or looking at this text. Um, OK. Was everybody able to uh, understand this exercise, if not necessarily complete it? Though all I wanted you to do is change the index formula. How do you go from thread and block rank to linear index into an array? And obviously, it's non-unique map. And therein lies some challenge. Just for this very simple problem, how do you decide on how to match a thread in a block to a, a piece of work? It's a non-unique choice. Sometimes the hardware gives you some clues as what to do. One of the things you probably didn't want to do is have the odd even, so the odd threads doing one part of the array and then the even threads doing a whole different part of the array. You could make a really bad choice because behind the scenes, when we get to optimizing CUDA code, we have to be very careful that the threads in a block are accessing sort of a nearby chunk of an array. Another bad choice would be to have more than one thread trying to write to the same entry in the array because you'll get one of these race conflicts, write race conflict. Right, so just to give you a quick example, which is the Poisson problem. Um, have we seen this before in examples so far? Uh, solving elliptic Laplace problem by discrete finite differences. Yep, we've seen this. Okay, so elliptic Poisson problem. We're on a grid. We have a stencil, finite difference stencil of those um, discretization of those derivatives. So if we look at it, we're uh, performing an update on a two-dimensional lattice. We update the formula for the central node based on that plus stencil around that central node, right? The beautiful thing about this problem is I can compute the update for this guy independently of the update for this guy and independently of the update for this guy as long as I'm writing into a new array. So I uh, just skip through this and mathematically there's a Jacobi iteration which says my new solution at each node depends on the four neighbors and itself on the, the right-hand side. We have to decide when to stop the problem, so I'll say use an RMS measure to decide whether the iterates are sufficiently close so I can stop iterating. Okay, that boils it down into a very simple keep performing this update formula and decide when to stop based on that formula. So, what does the serial kernel look like? It says loop over in ij index space um, over the rows, uh, columns and rows of that, of that lattice and use that update formula to decide what the new guess is to the uh, solution at each node is based on that. This, I can't reliably get this thing to give me a cursor. Um, based on that update formula, right? What does the CUDA version say? Well, since we're allowed to allocate two-dimensional arrays of thread blocks, and inside those thread blocks they can be two-dimensional, I can create a two-dimensional tiling of my finite difference lattice, and then inside those tiles I can perform that update formula, right? So here I've got a two-dimensional block index, which is indexed through the X and Y components of the block index and the thread index. And I can say if it's a legal uh, column, if it's a legal row, then I can reconstruct the index into the array and I can perform that update formula. That's it. It's a very simple, probably really poorly poor performing um, kernel that would 
perform the Jacobi iteration for uh, solving the Poisson problem, okay? All I've done is this, uh, created a map from my Cartesian grid of nodes based on, I've partitioned that into blocks, and then in each block I've assigned threads which uh, cover each of the nodes inside that block. So that's the serial code, and there's the parallel version. And you see I've lost those double for loops because the for loops are encoded in the thread array. Make sense? Right? It's the same exact mental process I went through with partitioning the vector add. Or the vector, the simple example I had before. But there's a trickier problem. I want to decide when to stop my Jacobi iteration. So I need to compute the RMS of the difference between my two consecutive iterates. But it's a reduction, right? I've got to sum up all the differences, the squares of the differences of all the nodes before I take the square root. So that's a pain, right? Because I've got this massively parallel processing unit. It's great when all the threads are doing something separate and different. Well, so they're all doing their own separate task. But now I've got to get them to coordinate. So what do you think I'm going to do? Well, I've given you the clue to start. I'm going to do a block reduction. I'm going to partition that sum into a block sum. So it's the same principle as I used before in partitioning the for loop in the simple example. But now I'm going to reduce it so that then on the thread block level, I'm going to do a partial reduction of the, uh, that residual vector, right? So I'm going to say, divide that residual vector into chunks of 512, and then I'm going to do a reduction on those 512 values down to 1. So how many thread blocks I'll get that many values, which then I can finally copy to the, the host and complete the reduction on the host, right? Or I could just run the reduction process again, just with less thread blocks, until I've kept reducing down that uh, thing, I'm, that vector I'm trying to reduce down to one value, okay? So this isn't rocket science. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get my, all my threads in my thread block to load one value. And I'm going to use the shared memory array that I haven't talked about yet. Each core, so remember, all the threads in the thread block are resident on a core together. They all have access to, an, uh, to a shared memory space. So what I'm going to do is get all the threads to load one value into a shared memory array. Then I'm going to be merciless. I'm going to kill half the threads. And then I'm going to say, the remaining half, you're going to each do one addition in the reduction. And then what am I going to do? Kill half and get a quarter of the threads to do one addition. Then what am I going to do? Kill, I mean, this is merciless, right? <laughs> I'm literally going to kill the threads until there's one thread left standing, which does the final sum. And I've got the graphic here. So, in this example, I've got eight threads in a block. They've each loaded one value. I've killed these top four. The bottom four are going to do the sum of, in fact, in this case, I've taken this thread is going to do this value plus this value and put the, the result back in shared memory. And then I'm, I'm going to, um, then I've got the posh, I've got an intermediate result. I'm going to kill these threads and then I'm going to repeat the process till we've got one thread left standing. This is nothing more than a binary tree reduction at the level of a thread block, okay? So it's a collaborative effort. It's not necessarily a highly efficient uh, process, but it's one of the best options we have. So in pseudocode, each thread figures out who it is. We'll say the live total is the number of threads in the thread block, and then we'll load up, um, each thread will load one value from the global array into the shared memory array, we'll say while there's more than one uh, thread alive, we'll synchronize the threads because what we have to do is make sure that when we've loaded data into shared memory, all of the data is in shared memory before we can proceed because it might be that 
some, th some group of 32 threads finishes, and it's, w it's ready to do the next part of reduction, but the other threads, other groups of 32, have not completed their loads. So we've got to make sure that everybody's uh, on the same page. So we introduce, introduce a barrier and synchronize the threads in the thread block before um, we kill half of them and we uh, reuse the uh, shared memory. Keep doing that. And at the last step, one thread is alive and it will write out one value from the thread block. So the reduction ratio, if we had 1,024 threads in the thread block, we will take a vector which is of length n, and we will have reduced the length of the, the, the vector in the reduction by a factor of 1,024, which is a pretty good uh, reduction ratio, right? And we can just keep calling this until we get down to one value, or we can just offload this result onto the host by a CUDA mem copy and complete the reduction on the host. At some point, it it makes sense to offload on to, or unload back onto the host. In actual code, the new syntax is we declare this block sum uh, shared memory array using this underscore underscore shared underscore underscore keyword. And that just means that's an array that all threads in a thread block have access to. Okay? So each thread figures out where it is in the linear array, loads one value. Um, what am I doing here? Oh no, it initializes it to zero, so that all the values in the shared memory array are initialized, and then if it uh, has a legal index, it will load the values into the shared memory, and at that point, we can start this tree reduction. We make sure we synchronize before anybody does anything. After we've killed half the threads, then we'll just do that first phase in the reduction, and we'll keep repeating till there's only one thread alive. After we're done, there's one thread alive, it writes out the result, we're good to go. Does that make sense? It's a very quick overview of a very simple reduction. There's like a seven step program where you take this very simple reduction and you tune it several times and you can get actually close to streaming bandwidths from this kernel. But um, we don't need to go through all those optimizations for this introduction. So, create a shared memory array access, accessible by all threads in the thread block. Load entry, load values into the, into the shared memory. Make sure you've synchronized. Kill half the threads and keep reducing until there's only one value left. Okay. I don't think we have time for this, but during the um, uh, Tim's presentation yesterday, I thought his Mandelbrot or the Mandelbrot example was a pretty good example. So uh, while he was doing that, I coded up an example where you can uh, take a skeleton code and apply um, CUDAization to the skeleton code, and you can actually make it um, uh, a CUDA implementation of that same area of a Mandelbrot example. But I want to skip past that, because I think we've got more interesting example later on. OK. I'm going to skip this. It's in the notes, but there's things you should know about using shared memory, about using um, barriers, and so on. OK, but I think it's more important that we spend some time talking about portability. Um, everything I've talked about so far is CUDA, and CUDA is a single vendor solution. It is a proprietary programming model and proprietary toolchain, and it is entirely property of NVIDIA. So, let me tell you a sad story. This was my laptop. It, lost, it lived for a year and a half. It had a nice NVIDIA GPU. It died. That's what you get when the uh, laptop uh, MacBook Pro dies. You get a, a sad, sad, uh, where's my hard drive kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, that's the last Apple I knew, Apple MacBook, that I know that had an NVIDIA GPU. So now what do I do? I'm not going to use a Windows laptop. <laughs> <laughs> but there is another different, the, 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 some of the later G, uh, Apple ma laptops have uh, other GPUs. So in fact, NVIDIA is not the only vendor that has an accelerator or GPU solution. Um, 
these are a little dated, but you can get an Intel CPU, which can also have an integrated GPU. You can get an AMD uh, advanced processing unit, which also has uh, a GPU and CPU cores. The Xeon Phi has a number of cores. NVIDIA's got its thing. AMD has its own GPUs, uh, and so on. But there are several different ways to program each of these different devices. If you want to program an OpenMP, you can program the Intel, solu Intel solutions and the AMD solutions with OpenMP. OpenACC will get you some of the other accelerators. CUDA will get you the NVIDIA GPU. They used to have an Intel x86 solution. I don't know if they still do that. But OpenCL, which is the open compute language, can program all of these things. There's a dash line to the field programmable gate array because it, sort, it has a large amount of the functionality of OpenCL, but not all of it, for various reasons. OK, so let's talk about open compute language. Uh, so Tim mentioned yesterday that he was actually on the standards committee for OpenCL. I, I felt like I should make a complaint to him, but he seemed to be on a, on a bit of a, a tear, so I didn't want to get in the way of it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I've ever seen anything good come out of a committee, <laughs> but um, OpenCL is definitely the product of a committee. Um, it is actually, in something a bit, it's almost a miracle that it's actually happened. Um, and it was largely driven by Apple. So Apple saw the success of CUDA and the potential of CUDA, but it did not want to be beholding to NVIDIA. And you can see now, they don't have NVIDIA chips in their laptops, for instance, right? So they wanted multiple vendors they can play against each other. But they didn't want to be uh, locked into NVIDIA's CUDA solution, so they basically uh, set up or drove the formation of the OpenCL, OpenCL Standards Committee and somehow brought together NVIDIA and AMD as active participants in the design of an open version of CUDA, OpenCL. They're not the only participants, but they're the main participants we care about for this discussion. OpenCL does this differ from CUDA in one regard. You can use it to program GPUs and CPUs. But that also adds some complexity that we'll see in a moment. Right, so just to give you a sense of the background, I'm sorry this isn't very legible, it's just a timeline. So some of the earliest work on GPU programming was in the Brook GPU uh, programming work. It was an academic project, PhD projects. Um, the, harness some of the power in GPUs. NVIDIA hired some of the best PhDs from these groups and created CUDA in about 2007. A little later in the year, AMD hired some of the other people from uh, that group and they've released the AMD Stream uh, SDK. And then it all starts to take off a little bit. Um, by middle of 2008, Apple says, okay, uh, and they pushed, put together this OpenCL working group. Um, and between May 2008 and October 2008, the Standards Committee is formed and they produce the OpenCL standard. Nine months? Less, right? For, uh, five months? Okay, so ask yourself this. How does a Standards Committee a body of, of diverse stakeholders from all these different companies, how do, they produce a com how do they produce a standard in five months? What was that? They copied somebody's template. Borrowed, yes. They borrowed, <laughs> they borrowed CUDA. And we'll see how deeply they borrowed it in a second. So, um, OpenCL is very closely related to CUDA. Term terminology is very similar. You have kernels, host programs. A thread in CUDA becomes a work item. It's a little more generic term, right? Because a thread may not really be a thread if you're on some bizarre platform like an FPGA. It might be something else that's not a sequence of 
of instructions as you would normally understand a thread. It could be a sequence of gates that perform a sequence of operations. But the terminology is thread becomes work item, thread block becomes work group, grid becomes, that's like the grid of blocks, becomes n-dimensional range. Every thread that's created in OpenCL gets a rank. But instead of using these intrinsic variables, thread, ID, thread index and block index, you use get local, which gets the index of a thread in a block, and get global, which gets you the global index in the whole array of threads. So usually I, I ask the question, who prefers the intrinsic variables and who prefers the sort of more API approach. So who prefers this one? Who prefers this one? Yeah, you're odd. Nobody likes that. <laughs> okay, so um, are, you, are you beginning to see that there's really OpenCL is more or less a, a grammatically challenged version of CUDA? It's just they changed the syntax slightly and they changed the grammar slightly. Grid dim becomes get num groups, block idx gets group id, block dimension gets get local size, and so on. You can get the global size, and you can figure out everything but through kernels. Um, the annotation and keywords for a kernel function, instead of underscore, underscore, global, underscore, underscore, becomes underscore, underscore, kernel function. Okay, so they change the keywords, they change the way you find the thread rank, block rank, block dimensions, but the philosophy, the approach, the model is the same. The memory model is the same. On the left, we have the, the memory model for um, adopted by the thread blocks. They access the global memory, constant memory, texture memory. We haven't talked about those, this different cache types of global memory. And here we have, on the OpenCL side, basically synonymous. But there's a, there's a hitch. So you instantly should say, why isn't everybody programming OpenCL? And the answer is learning curve. I'm English. When we go to a restaurant, we have a one-page menu. It's, it's just chips, beans. You can have them any order you want. Chips or beans, beans, <laughs> beans and chips. That's what you get. In this country, they give you a book, right? You get to wade through and say, what's your answer, appetizer, you know, different types of, basically it's all chicken and fish, but um, <laughs> or beef if you're in Texas. But there's this enormous menu of options, right? And this is the problem that's fundamental to OpenCL because it's not just targeting one vendor solution, one NVIDIA GPU. You could have a system that has several CPUs, several GPUs, and you've got to accommodate the OpenCL implementation of each of them. So we have to make some choices. And I don't want to really dwell on the API, but basically the problem is that you get first, when you, when you want to run a program on an on a OpenCL device, you have to choose which platform, so which vendor implementation of OpenCL, could be Intel, could be AMD, could be NVIDIA. Once you've got the platform, you want to find out what devices are available, and you have to choose a device. So in CUDA, there's a default device choice. In OpenCL, there is no default devi device choice because it's not a, it's not a well-posed choice. Once you've got the device, you need to create a context, like a, a, a manager that's going to work with on that device. Once you've got the context, you then have to create a command queue on that device. So if we look at code, in CUDA, we'll need to specify some header files. In OpenCL, same thing. But Apple, being Apple, has a different header file than the rest of the OpenCL implementations. Go figure. In the CUDA implementation, in the main file, you don't have to do anything. You've given the default device. In OpenCL, you've got to get the platform IDs. You've got to choose a device or get a list of the device IDs and then choose a device. In OpenCL, then you've got to create a context on the device. Then you've got to create a queue on the device. And now we've got to work with the program, you're going to, the kernel you're going to run on the device. So if you think about it, we're already in combinatorial hell because we've, we've got a number of platforms times a number of devices times and so on, right? You've got all these choices. So the typical solution is to build the kernel executables at runtime. 
So we start from source code. We're going to load the source code, build the program from the source code, make sure you didn't get a build error when you, ran, when you built that program at, or kernel at runtime, because you know we don't all program correctly the first time. And then from that program, you're going to build a kernel. OK. None of that is necessary in CUDA, because the compiler, the NVIDIA CUDA compiler, will do that build for you. Right. Now, we're still in choice hell, because we've got to now allocate the arrays. In CUDA, we'd use CUDA memcopy. In OpenCL, we need to use CL create buffer. And this is where it gets awful, because every time you execute an a, a OpenCL kernel, you've got to attach the arguments to the kernel. Well, at least you've got to do it at least once so that the kernel knows what the arguments are because you aren't creating literally a function. You're creating an object which can then be queued. Once you've got the arguments added to the, the kernel, then you can queue it up. And then when, if you want to wait for it to finish, you can wait for it to finish. So in code, the malloc and the create buffer are pretty much the same thing. But when we get to launching the kernels, we've got to, first of all, add the kernel, add the arguments to the kernel before we call a function which actually queues that kernel. This is why OpenCL is not the basic choice for the most programmers. OK. The good news is the kernel code is more or less the same thing, right? On the left, you use the thread index, blogger blog index, block dim. On the right, you can just use the global ID. But it has a bit of a bad reputation. And it's primarily because what we've seen. Um, but there are other issues. CUDA came first. It's kind of, it's a bit like Beta, Betamax versus VHS. I don't know if you remember that, that fuss. But basically, um, timing was everything. CUDA had better market timing, had better market execution. So there's a richer set of literature on CUDA. There are more books. There's more libraries. There's more uh, user involvement. There's more programmer involvement. So you can see forums and everything else. Um, the solutions offered or platforms offered by Intel, uh, Apple, NVIDIA have annoying specific differences. Um, the Intel, looking at you, John, Johan, <laughs> the Intel implementation on CPUs is uh, hamstrung or can be hamstrung. So, there are some technical difficulties in getting it to work and getting it to be really portable. Um, adding runtime compilation makes it a little bit more complicated. But on the other hand, I can now do runtime specialization without templating. So since you're building a, building a kernel at runtime, I can hard code in all sorts of loop bounds that you cannot code in so well with CUDA, but have the uh, bounds that may need to be known at runtime. And it's vendor, uh, vendor independent. So if you're writing a $20 million code, there's uh, three, four different uh, vendors who are offering solutions for OpenCL. So here's the serial implementation of the kernel. Here's the CUDA implementation. And the OpenCL version is just going to be a slightly tweaked version of this, where we just change the keywords and the approach for getting rank from um, the API, OK? So at the kernel level, it's hard to argue there's anything wrong with OpenCL. At the API level, I'd say there's a lot wrong with OpenCL because there's really no default options. If they had a basic default OpenCL, a lot of problems would have gone away. That's the fundamental stumbling, stumbling block. There's tree reductions, the same thing. The syntax is slightly different. Shared is local. And instead of using a sync threads, we're using a barrier, a local memory fence barrier. Right, so I've said that there are some downsides to OpenCL. We rely on the good nature of the, company, of the companies involved in the OpenCL standard to provide good implementations of OpenCL. For a long time, he's nodding there. <laughs> Uh, it, for a long time, NVIDIA publicly stated that the OpenCL was going to be deprecated 
and was a second-class citizen compared to CUDA. That's changed a little bit, but in essence, they're still emphasizing using CUDA on NVIDIA platforms, but also OpenACC. OpenCL is very rarely mentioned. Um, so what to do, what to do? So we've seen that one already. It's good. Boop, doop, doop. There are several options. Some of the options for portability say, OK, you've got CUDA code. Let's start with CUDA code, and let's do code translation. Let's mutate that CUDA code into OpenCL. So there's uh, actually, oddly enough, a Virginia Tech uh, product called Cuticle, um, which will take NVIDIA CUDA code and translate it to OpenCL. Seems like a good solution, right? It'll translate the host code, that, uh, that stuff that interacts with the CUDA API, and turn it into OpenCL API calls. And it'll take the kernel code and mutate it into um, OpenCL kernels. There's a different solution. I'm not sure if it's really uh, taken off yet, but AMD has a solution called HIP. And there's something called HIPify, which is a tool which effectively does the same thing. Converts, converts CUDA code through HIPify into HIP code that can target AMD platforms and NVIDIA, apparently. And then another way is to go low level, where you take the compiled CUDA code and push it through Ocelot, which is an academic project, which can then target multiple different uh, devices. And PGI, at some point, had an x86 compiler for CUDA. I'm not going to talk about OpenACC or OpenMP, but they offer different ways to program these devices. Uh, OK, so in terms of maturity, this is just my opinion. The AMD uh, solutions for portability are not as well developed as OpenMP and OpenACC for accelerators, which are not as well developed as OpenCL and CUDA. And in terms of ease of use, CUDA's definitely up. It's most mature, easiest to use, but least portable. So you, you sort of have that balancing act as to whether you really want maturity or portability. So if we step back, we have a question. And it's a very, very uh, serious question, which is if you're going to use one of these large-scale leadership facilities, you're going to use MPI for the distributed computing. That's already pretty much decided. That battle was fought in the 90s, and MPI won. We're still fighting a battle of what's going to be the, port, what's going to be the threading solution for these massively parallel processes. Okay? Um, so you will have adherence to all of these possible solutions. So MPI for distributed, and then MPI, uh, some people claim use MPI uh, for threading on CPUs, or OpenMP, or P threads, or CUDA, or OpenCL, OpenACC, thread building blocks, Silk Plus. What is the actual solution we should use? Should we write a code for each of these different approaches? No, because you take the cost of the code you're writing and you multiply it by the number of things you're going to target. Right? So if you've got a million dollar code and you're going to write four different versions, that's going to cost you $4 million. This is where I come in. So this is my 10 minutes sales pitch for my thing. I told you I wasn't going to sell anything, but I kind of lied. So uh, I had a PhD student who worked at uh, an oil company in Houston. And one of his tasks was taking a CUDA code and porting it to OpenCL. This is an incredibly smart guy. And he burned a summer doing that, right? And he came back to me, and I was kind of pissed. It's like, why are you burning your, why are you wasting your time doing that? So I said, we're going to put an end to that. We're going to write an abstract layer, which will automate the process of what he did in his summer uh, internship. So instead of writing at CUDA directly or writing at OpenCL directly, we'll write to an abstract layer and let that do the translation behind the scenes at runtime and uh, as, as uh, efficiently as possible. This is what we have. It's called Arca. It has APIs for Julia, Python, C++, C. I'm not sure of this, but I think it might still work. We, we're not really Fortran friendly, so it's there, but I'm not sure it's really uh, mature. We have an API. Behind the scenes, we have a parser, and it can take in CUDA code, OpenCL code, or our own custom kernel languages. It will push them through an intermediate representation, which was 
portable across the different back-end platforms, which can then map to naturally to the uh, appropriate hardware in the back-end. Okay? So your involvement would be writing a host code in the, your favorite language and writing a kernel either in, the, in OpenCL CUDA or in what we call the OKL OCL language. What does it do? Single unified library for programming heterogeneous devices. It's flexible at runtime to choose. You write the code once, and then at runtime you say, okay, I want to run on this CPU with OpenMP, or I want to run on this GPU with uh, OpenCL or CUDA. You choose, right? Very simple choose, very choice, very simple API. In the background, we have a lot of technology that supports this. So we have a caching system which will cache the, ex the binaries for the, the uh, kernels you're gonna execute on the device so that we don't rebuild them every time you run the program. If you've already touched that d device on that platform with that threading model, we'll load that uh, program from cache. Um, it's very lightweight, and we made some choices with the uh, kernel language to try and make it a little friendlier. It doesn't do anything magic. It does not auto parallelize it doesn't make that loop partitioning problem, those parallel partitioning decisions for you. You have to decide how to do that yourself still. It does not auto-optimize. It still helps to know something about the architecture. It doesn't tell you how to lay out your data and memory. It doesn't, tell, it doesn't uh, magically decide that MPI tasks can be, or OCA tasks can be distributed amongst MPI tasks. You have to do that. Um, but it does use the vendor compilers. So we don't have a, a very deep a compiler stack to support. So it's portable. We, have, uh, we don't quite have time to do this, but we'll wrap this into the final demo. There are other solutions you're gonna hear from. Um, Carter Edwards, who think, I think who's gonna talk about Cocos, which is sort of a, an array class on steroids that uh, has some of the same capabilities, that it has multiple backends. Um, there's another project from Raja from Livermore, which again is sort of a high level um, portable um, threading program model. And then you have some lower level um, approaches which are co-translation. So it sort of st sits in the middle of the, of the options. Um, so this is sort of how a prototype kernel would look like. We do have a kernel keyword. We actually argued about this for about six hours, whether we needed this keyword or not but we kept that. We've kept in for loops, so instead of throwing them out and, and just using the thread index and block index, we've kept explicitly required the programmer to put those for loops in so we know what they are, okay? But they have some extra keywords at the end. We've added a clause into the for loop which uh, tells you that basically if it's an outer loop, it's a loop over thread blocks. If it's an inner loop, it's a loop over threads. So the, each iteration of the outer loops gets mapped to a core. Each iteration of the inner loop gets mapped to a thread running on that core. Okay? So it's the same threading model as CUDA and OpenCL. And it's very similar to the threading model for OpenMP because what we'll do is we'll leave these inner loops intact to make them serial and we'll just use a parallel for on the outer loops. Okay. So this will... We'll do all sorts of nice generation. We can uh, have multiple outer loop blocks. I'm just trying to skip through some of the right, grittier details so you don't really need to see it. But what happens behind the scenes is we generate some intermediate representation and that can run in CUDA, OpenCL, or OpenMP. Okay, so here's an example. Hopefully you can read this. This is the host code. So we'll do stuff on the host. We'll say allocate three arrays. We'll have a device object, a kernel object, a mem some memory objects. We'll say with a string, I want to use OpenCL mode, and then I'm gonna choose which platform, which device. I'm gonna allocate some space on those, those, uh, that, that device. I'm gonna copy the data from the host. I'm gonna build the kernel to run on that device. Then I'm gonna launch that kernel as it kind of looks like a function call. Because we have our own parser that works behind the scenes, we figure out 
what the thread blocks you want and what the blo bl uh, grid blocks you want, right? So we do all that detective work. And you don't have to specify here how many threads you want in each block and how many blocks you want. So we'll, we'll figure that out for you. And then finally, we'll copy the data back. Okay. Now that kernel is just some source code and the kernel source code will manually ask you to tile that array. We also have a tile keyword you can use, but this is simpler to, to convey the, the, the general usage. We'll say loop over blocks, and then I can say loop in block from block index to block plus 10, and, and there we go. We've got the um, uh, kernel implemented. So it's very simple. You basically need to know three key keywords, and you can do a lot of things inside Ocker. And at runtime, you decide, is this really going to be used as OpenMP? Is it going to be used as OpenCL? Is it going to be used as CUDA? You can do this in C with a C interface, Julia interface, Python interface, MATLAB interface. Oh, oh well, I guess MATLAB got killed. Uh, <laughs> nobody was using it, so we don't use that. Right, so we have the serial implementation of the Jacobi iteration, the CUDA, and then the OpenCL implementation. And we have an intermediate representation which gets generated from this Ocker kernel language. And you can see we've just doubly partitioned the um, loop over nodes in that direction, loop over nodes in the y direction. And you can see it, it looks more like code to me. You know. And we've got some interesting technology behind the scenes, which I'm not going to dwell on, which <laughs> there's a lot of buttons to press here. OK. So all magically happens behind the scenes. All that device selection platforms, so everything just sort of magically gets done without you worrying about it. So here's our last hands-on exercise. We've got about 10 minutes. Hopefully we can do it. Did it work for you? Yeah. Good. OK, so I want you to create a flow simulation like this using the PNG file you've already found. Yes? Um, with interfaces to the uh, host languages, how far um, are you restricted to use certain functions? So for example, with Python, can I just write my standard Python numpy functions and uh, OCA does at the bottom, how to parallelize? No. There's a different solution for that called LoopPy, which will do that, or you could use PyCuda or PyOpenCL. But um, we will expect you to provide the right kernel language. It's just the host API is Python. Yep, sorry. Um, but there's, some, there's something called loo.py, which will do what you're talking about by Andreas Klockner. OK, so here's where, yes? I should note, you have to use the alpha channel on the background to make okay. it actually. Okay. okay. We'll see if we have problems with that. Right. This is the fun part. This is why I kind of rush through portability. But I just want you to, to run this fluid simulation code, and you're going to use it. It's, it's implemented in Ocker, and you'll be able to run it in the different modes, and you can see how simple it is just to switch between open, uh, CUDA or OpenMP, whatever you want to use. So what it's going to do is going to take your PNG file, and it's going to form a domain out of that. So once it's read in the PNG file, it's going to set up a lattice where it's got fluid, fluid nodes and wall nodes. On the fluid nodes, it's going to perform collision and streaming calculations. So it's like a Lagrangian code. Um, and it's basically a, a discrete version of the Boltzmann equation. And what we do is every 100 time steps, we output a PNG file. So you're going to get a bunch of snapshots of the solution data. And then you can use uh, FFmpeg to take those PNG files and create an MP4 video file. OK? So let's be competitive. Let's see if you can create the best animation. Right? And tell you what, if what we'll do is if you send me the animation, I'll create a directory. And then you all can vote on it, OK? And it won't be today, but we'll, vote. we'll do this over email. And then the best, best animation, you can take a while to do this, even if you don't finish it today. The best animation, I'll send a box of fine English candy made in the Middle East somewhere as a prize, <laughs> OK? So there's a prize on the line for this, right? You'll need to send me. Um, well, the winner, I'll ask for an address, and I'll send you that. Right. So how do we do this? 
It's going to rely on the Oka library. So there's instructions for building the Oka library. You're going to build the Oka LBM code, which is um, uh, the instructions are in the second box. You're going to take the PNG format file, which there are some restrictions on. Not all PNGs are created equal. So it's, if it seg faults, then we we'll need to diagnose what the problem is. Um, you'll save the PNG format. Uh, in your directory, and you'll run the LBM code with um, those arguments. That last argument is like a threshold. It says, what are volume pixels? What are wall pixels? We're going to solve, uh, use an LBM update formula, do some time stepping, and figure out what the flow characteristics of, of flow from left to right. And where it's white, we'll treat that as flow volume. Where it's black, we'll treat that as, as wall. And as the thing computes, it's going to create a sequence of image files, bar something, something, something dot PNG. And this command up here will piece them together into a movie called foo.mp4. When you've got that, just use Globus or whatever you're using to transfer files to grab that mp4 file and load it onto your laptop and play it in your browser or whatever you use to, to view video files. Does that make sense? OK, remember, there's money on the line here. <laughs> Not money, candy on the line. OK, so everybody got it? Yes? Uh, uh, where does uh, array fire fit in the ecosystem? Uh, array fire. OK, so if I remember correctly, these are the professional grade AMD GPUs. This is what you're thinking of? Or are you thinking about the company called Array Fire, which has its own uh, library? Um, they've been around for a while. Uh, sort of a higher level interface, I think. So sort of at the level of libraries, I think. I haven't looked at their product in a long time. I'll, I, I haven't looked at it in like five years. So I can't remember all the details. Any other questions while you're making your movies? OK, so I'll put the first set of instructions up. I have a sort of more complicated version of this for a final assignment in a GPU programming class, for, actually a parallel programming class for juniors at tech. They had to take the serial version of LBM and make a parallel version. It could be MPI, OpenMP, or CUDA. And what do students do with an assignment? They wait for the last second. So I set the assignment up so that to, to generate the, the flow movie, takes a certain number of hours with the serial code. Nobody wanted to do the MPI implementation, of course, because MPI is a bit harder to deal with. Now, I'm being, I've got an angry face there. But the, the ones that pushed it off longer, longest had the choice of OpenMP or CUDA. And if they really pushed the deadline, they had to implement it in CUDA. So I was using some social engineering to force the students who could get, you know, it takes 10 hours to run an open MP, but if they ran in CUDA, it could get it down to an hour, right? Um, I hope I've given you a flavor of GPU programming. I hope you get a sense that it's not that complicated. And if you're more progressive and are willing to use uh, an abstraction layer, there are several solutions for abstracting above programming directly into one of the thread models. And then I round it off by showing you that Oka is a very simple, straightforward interface that you can use to actually uh, code once and deploy on pretty much any platform. You will have to tune your code for the specific platform you're going to run on, but that's a different question, and we don't have time to address that. Any questions? Yes? You take uh, a CUDA kernel you've written. Use Akka to produce a CUDA kernel. Same thought. Sorry. Same performance. Same performance. It, As CUDA. Yes. it looks different, but it's the same performance. Yes, because we'll, transmor we'll transmogrify it back to CUDA. And everything we add will disappear when it, through the, um, when it gets to the compiler. So we can preserve. If you take a CUDA kernel, make an Akka kernel, you can get back CUDA performance to within 1%, because we might have a slightly different launch cost. Yes. Are you compiling on a compute mode? Yes. You might make clean and then make. 
Does not work. Right. Mine threw those errors, but it still works. Yeah. Sort of oh, is that warning? Ignore those warnings. They're just warnings. Is error while loading to your libraries. My, uh, as your library to your LD path. What was that? Sorry, one at a time. You have to explore the LD library path to your OCA library. Otherwise, you won't be able to load the shared library. What well, he says. Or, uh, that's the old way oh, yeah. to do it. There should be a new way to do it, guys. Um, yeah, so I should have added that instruction. It's load library path equals load library path slash, uh, colon slash OCA slash underscore dia slash lib. Okay? They really are getting, they're giving the timeout signal. So I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much.